Mm. Evaluation of impact. The role of evaluation and. Sorry about that. My guest today is Professor Julia Lane, who's a professor at the NYU Wagner Graduate School of Public Services. She served in the National AI Research Resources Task Force and also on the Advisory Committee on Data for Evidence Building. Her book, Democratizing Our Data and Manifesto, was published in 2020. And, uh, and Julia, you were one of the early guests on this podcast two years ago. Yes, I really enjoyed it the first time, so I'm looking forward to this time. Welcome. Um, so, so we have a sort of a general, broad conversation around AI and policy. Um, and I want to sort of split the decision, maybe split, split the discussion, I should say, into three different buckets, data, technology, and value, or the use of that. So I want to start with data. I know that you have done a lot of work around this. Uh, obviously, everybody knows data is exponentially increasing. Um, there is, uh, as, as data increases, there's also noise in that data. So it is in somewhat unclear if exponential increase in data is going to really improve decision making. So what, what's the general sense of uh, how data is expanding and how it's going to help us? Yeah, so there's a lot to cover in just those few sentences, right? So um, that was one of the issues I think that is so important with um, with thinking about these new kinds of data and the role of the data with AI, because um, as as you already know from the private sector, uh, so much of the value comes out of combining data from different sources. Yeah. That's how they know what to sell you, right? That's how they target the ads. That's why um, when Apple decided to have an opt-in rather than an opt-out policy on identifying the browsers that you were using, Facebook or Meta's market value dropped by 25%. It's one of the reasons. Um, so, so the 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 value of data comes from combining it from different sources and you know as you said it's very noisy it's very dirty one of the dangers that comes up from combining data from different sources is you don't know how the links are being made and whether they're correct or and so on so so one of the challenges that we dealt with on the uh, research task resources task force is for a lot of um, AI, you need high quality data sets. Mm. How are you going to define quality? And right. who's going to make that decision? And how are you going to decide that links are correct, particularly when it's confidential? So, you know, that's foundational to a lot of AI work. And, um, you know, there are obvious ethical and technical and access issues that, that are associated with it. So, yeah, so all of those issues are sort of fundamental to uh, how the technology could use data. Uh, and as you say, when data is coming from different sources, whether we are combining it properly, uh, whether we are looking at the data correctly, is <laughs> also also quite important. Um, I mean, my sense, Julia, is that, correct me if I'm wrong, there's a lot of excitement in the market about artificial intelligence. I, I talk to a lot of people in this area, and I get the feeling that some of them don't know what artificial intelligence is. Um, some of them is just too excited that a singularity is coming, and we've been waiting for the singularity for 20 years now. Uh, and um, the use cases and the applications, many of them are not very robust. So we are we are sort of in the initial stages of a revolution. Would you agree with that? I think that's right. I think that's part of what was so exciting about being on the task force. That was a phenomenal group of individuals 
and and very well run and managed, I'm going to say, out of uh, OSTP and NSF. But the um, the 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 importance of investing in AI research right now is um, that it is a new technology. There is tremendous potential. I think there was a big concern that because it is so expensive to run and you need big machines and big data sets and so on, that the AI was kind of getting uh, into the realm of just a few. And the goal of the Research Resources Task Force is to broaden the access to and use of the resources, compute and data and training, uh, so that it wasn't just the realm of a, of, a, of a privileged few. And I think that's going to be important because it is, as you say, an untested technology. We, we still don't know uh, the, the potential minefields. We do know that it can stimulate enormous amounts of innovation. We've seen that over and over again. But where are the where are the bumps in the road? And unfortunately, you may end up with it working perfectly fine for large groups of people, but then for marginalized subgroups, there may be um, areas where you've where you've got problems, and you're not going to know about them unless there's broad and diverse access. Yeah. So the task force is really uh, doing a, a really important work here because. From a policy perspective, there are questions around monopoly, right? So if, you know, a couple of firms in Silicon Valley and one in Redmond uh, has um, unlimited amount of resources, uh, it is quite possible for them to create uh, AI technologies far superior to uh, what anybody else can do. So if you have concentration like that, concentration of resources, technology, availability, and to some extent people too, um, because increasingly it might be the case that in AI, if you're really you know, coming out of computer science, graduate school, um, I mean, you have a couple of options. You can go work for a small company or you can work for a large company. The latter appears to be more dominant because uh, large companies have a lot of resources. So it, it, is, um, it, it is sort of a process that uh, self perpetuates itself and concentration continues to increase concentration. Do you see it that way? Well, you know, it's been so interesting. So again, you hit on a number of different things uh, there. So, uh, so, so one is that this notion of uh, AI kind of reducing predictions to just two or three voices, right? Because mm -hmm. you get the same models that are synthesizing all the information and, and making the decisions for you, uh, where, which is more efficient than having a cacophony or, or, or a massive amount of information that everyone has to process. But then it means you have to pay a lot of attention to uh, how good are those voices or are there biases in those voices? Um, I do think that um, there is a little bit of being overblown uh, that, that what things like chat uh, GPT has been doing, yeah. you know, because obviously that's exploded into the world over the past two or three months. And that was out of a relatively small business. It's, it's a disruptive uh, set of approaches. So, um, you know, I, I don't think it's monolithic uh, that, that, that the AI work is, is going to um, uh, only be owned by a few companies. There's always the disruptors, thank goodness. I am going to say uh, to, 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 to the other point that you made about um, uh, the potential for AI to kind of take over and make all the decisions for us. I really like the quotation from Picasso, where about 80 years ago, whenever, X number of years ago, uh, they, Picasso was asked about computers taking over the world. And he thought about it for a bit and he came back and he said, well, you know, the problem is, is that with computers, uh, they give you just the answers. Mm. It takes a human being to figure out what questions to ask. So 
you know, you can have tons and tons of different answers, but what are the questions and how are we going to know whether it's right or not? And that's really where the, you know, maybe the, the machines will take out the, the backbreaking work like coding and we'll be able to ask bigger and better questions. And that will always be an individual. That's not so much the machines, the big machines. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting uh, point, Julia. So, uh, I mean, Chat GPT is sort of the first iteration of this type of technology. I know Google and Microsoft started a competitor product called Sparrow, um, which is just just starting off. Um, conceivably, these these technologies could ask questions in the future. Uh, because you know some of the AI technologies that we build in in um, healthcare, for example, we are using um, idle time of the computer to play games, to play scenarios, uh, to get better. So you could imagine these types of technologies sort of using idle time to ask questions, and if they find the you know the right answers, those could be quite useful for a human, right? So we might be, you know, moving in that direction, potentially. Well, um, that goes back to your very early comment is that, well, we all know what AI is. And, and one of the things that we actually don't know, we have kind of a high level idea of what AI might be. But um, one of the challenges that we faced on the committee was exactly how do you measure AI, mm. right? So do we think about it as pure AI computer science research, or do we think of applied AI, in particular in the health fields or in uh, in um, geospatial or um, weather forecasting? You know, there are so many areas uh, in which AI is used. So, how do we even get a handle of who's working in the particular area? Um, the the challenge that we face is uh, the the way in which we've historically bucketed human activity, right? It's been in terms of industries, right? Yeah. Or, or scientific fields. Well, AI is neither an industry mm -hmm. nor a scientific field. Right. So how are we going to come to grips with how many people are working in it, which firms are involved in it, what uh, pieces, parts are involved? And I do have some ideas along those lines, but I just want to be clear that um, this is not something that's going to show up in the productivity statistics or in GDP statistics or so on, or even in science and engineering indicators. So there are some uh, approaches that have been developed, but there's no, um, no set statistically um, developed ways of thinking about what AI actually is and how it should be measured. Yeah, so if you design back, Julia, you know, design back from the value and the use of AI back to where we are today, both in terms of data and technology, um, where do you see AI adding the most value? Uh, and I know I'm not looking for precise areas, but generally speaking, where do you think it's going to have the, the highest impact? Well, um, so I'm going to be a little bit I'm going to give you an economist answer, not <laughs> a scientist answer. Right. So I think Congress was fairly clear in this, um, in in the charge, which was they wanted to look at AI to the extent that it spurred innovation, you know, that it uh, promoted diversity and 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 so on, uh, and increased competitiveness. So. I think that's where Congress saw the value as, as coming from. Mm. Um, I, to me, and again, I'm a labor economist, um, the, what we should be thinking about is, is not just technological value, but value in terms of the economic activity and the, um, and the distribution of the gains. Right. I mean, we saw from uh, big shocks to the economy like NAFTA, remember the, uh, yeah. the free trade agreements? Yeah. That that benefited a lot of people. It, it certainly stimulated economic growth to some extent, but it was very unequally distributed. And at least some people think that the 
hollowing out of Midwest manufacturing technology really negatively affected a lot of a, a lot of people. And it's part of the concern about the deaths of despair has been the loss of jobs that have been associated with that. So I think we, we need to pay um, a lot of attention to what the impact of AI is on the workforce and prepare the workforce for these changes in, um, in the way in which the economy operates. I mean, people talk about it as a machine learning revolution. When you remember when machines came in in the industrial revolution, you had the Luddites who came and broke all the machines because they were taking away the jobs. So this right. is a this is a common issue, but it is um, an issue that with evidence about you know what jobs are being affected by artificial intelligence, what what new jobs are emerging and what other jobs are disappearing, you can at least ease the path a little bit. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, you said a lot of things there, Julia. So there, there's a question of sort of aggregate productivity uh, improvement. And then there's a question of distribution of that, of that excess. Um, on the productivity front, I, I wrote a small piece on ChatGPT on LinkedIn, and I argued that ChatGPT is a bit like daytime running lights that policymakers were so excited about in the early 90s, going to reduce accidents. Um, what happened was drivers basically reset their expectations uh, when all, uh, all cars had the, the same technology. They just reset their ex expectations and we saw no change in accident rates uh, by the introduction of the technology. Uh, I see ChatGPT sort of in the same way in the sense that, yeah, so now, you know, it, it uh, it's writing college essays for students. It's creating customized letters for companies for their prospective clients. It could become sort of sophisticated spam. You know? <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. Yeah, I mean, uh, although I'm going to tell you that the faculty are, are figuring out how to how to deal with that. We're not uh, having people submit essays anymore, which. <laughs> it's how much easier because it's really good. We're asking direct questions in class, and you know, it's so we, you, you just, as you say, you just adapt. But you know, more practically, um, and obviously, I've talked to a lot of my colleagues about this. We, you don't have to write basic code Python anymore. You just everyone who has worked with Python says the 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 you can just tell chat to write the code and it comes up, you just check it and it's fine. So, you know, they're going to do, so it's just like the Luddites, right? They're going to do do the job of a weaver, yeah, a, a weaver of code, the same thing that happened to a, a, a cotton weaver with a, with a, a hand loom uh, 150 years ago. So, and, and you just have to be, uh, careful to make sure that those skills are not, you don't just throw those people on the trash heap, that you you um, move them into the to the next area. And that may be asking the questions rather than writing the code. Right? Yeah, I haven't really thought about this, Julia. So, you know, um, I, I'm of the firm belief that anything automatable will be automated in the future. So, uh, I mean, uh, you you mentioned sort of the human resource policy implications. What are humans going to do? Uh, anything repeatable will not be repeated by humans in the future. It's just a question of time. And if if technologies arise that allow that automation uh, go down faster, uh, then it has a lot of policy implications because I think. The current expectation is, you know, maybe a couple of decades before automation really kicks in. Uh, but if this intermediate technologies make uh, automation go a lot faster, then, then it's a different scenario, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so it's just, it is, I think um, our, our um, workforce infrastructure, then it, the, is, is, probably not designed to handle 
the, those transitions and our education infrastructure is is uh, needs to be um, rethought a little bit. Our labour market information systems, you know, what this the our continued focus on kindergarten through twenty, where everyone's in a little sausage machine and then pops out when they're twenty two years old and I'm done learning is probably not going to continue, right? So um, the, if you take a look at the work the Credential Engine has been doing, for example, they, um, uh, they have identified a million, over a million different types of short-term credentials mm. where you, know, you, have, um, uh, you can acquire different sets of skills uh, outside that K through 20 system. So you, know, you can go in and um, uh, take a, a three month or, credential and use that. There's also some other ideas such as these uh, learning employment records. Mm -hmm. So instead of the sausage factory issuing, which is a university or a, or a community college, issuing a credential and then, you know, you have to piece together these credentials from different places. Uh, the notion of being able to knit together a learning employment record that you carry with you, that is recognizable to the employer and translated into um, um, actionable information about the worker, uh, that, that's, that's a much more uh, flexible and agile approach to the, the workforce adjustment that we've been, just been talking about. Yeah, I know a lot about this, Julia, but I want to get your perspective. So I am a generally a big fan of Norway education system. Um, and I don't know how the situation. Yeah, you shouldn't say that. My mother's Swedish, so you can't say anything <laughs> good about Norway. <laughs> and you know, the other thing is, I, I grew up in New Zealand, so you can't say anything good about Australia either. I mean, I have very strong uh, lines that you can't cross. That's no, true. That's true. Tell me and about uh, the few good things about Norway. <laughs> yeah, and Australia, New Zealand has that cricket thing going too, so that, oh, that makes rugby. it even more difficult. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so Norway, my understanding is, and I haven't really studied this deeply, but my understanding is that they got out of the sausage, uh, as you say, um, making process. So no physics 101, biology 102, you know, type process. They say the students should design what they want to learn, sort of self-customized learning experience. Uh, which I think is going to be a lot more practical than going through this university system that we have that, I mean, for example, like you mentioned, Chad GPT is doing Python. There's really no reason to learn Python because you just ask the computer to do it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I teach this applied data analytics class uh, and uh, six, seven years ago, we taught a lot of Python, right? So yeah. now what we're teaching I like I start have my first class on Friday, and I said, well, "So, what do you want to get out of this class?" That's how I always start, and I have this poll everywhere thing. And three or four years ago, everyone wrote down Python. That was what they wanted to learn. <laughs> yeah. Now, what they are asking to do is, and this is kind of what Picasso said: they want to figure out how to scope questions. Mm. How how do you ask an operational question? Right. So, so uh, I, I am in the area of public policy. So let's say um, you're interested in reducing New York City crime. I'm in New York. Right. So what exactly does that mean? Well, and how can I use data to answer that question? And how can I use predictive analytics to figure out how to allocate police resources? And how do I figure out whether the violence interrupters, the community groups uh, uh, are doing their job? Those are very practical data-driven questions, but how do I go from that 800 foot question? So if you ask people, I'll say, well, we want to reduce trigger events. Mm. Okay, well, Triggers don't just leap around and, and go off, right? So there's a human being behind that. So, and where you can't just say trigger events across the board. I, are you going to look at in particular area? You know, so you've got to start asking the questions to scope something into a problem 
that can be translated into a machine learning actionable problem. Then you have to figure out what data can be brought to bear, and then you have to rescope the questions. Does that make sense? So 90% of the work is thinking about the problem and about the data. Then you can write the Python code, but it's trivial. Yes. Yeah, so let me push on this a little bit, Julia. I mean, I don't have strong opinions either way, and I haven't, I don't really know a lot about it. But for debate, I would say, are we, uh, pro are we thinking humans uh, are creative um, compared to machines, or it's just a, you know, sort of an intermediate uh, data point that we have? I mean, humans, one could argue, are automatons. They have a set of experiences and they make conclusions just like a computer. And we haven't used computers to really creatively think. Don't, don't tell my husband that, because he thinks there's a, <laughs> there's a certain random element to my decision-making. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so I, I want to you're, go you're, there. You're dodging a response to that, and that's a wise move. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I know. I, I mean, as a thought experiment, one could imagine computers getting very creative. I mean, in, in uh, astrophysics, for example, there's certain things that, you know, humans been trying to do, but machines appear to be a lot better in, in some of those things. And healthcare, we have seen this. So I don't think we can dismiss machines as, you know, sort of non-creative entities. In effect, they could become more creative than humans in the future. But they've got to learn from something and they're going to learn from human behavior, right? They're not, well, of course, now they're learning from each other, but that's another story. So. <laughs> um, right. No, so, um, so, so I want to touch on, um, I mean, we, we talked a little bit about it and policy questions. So you say that infrastructure, education, employment, companies, um, and even the government are not really set up with this impending change, right? So how do you think, how do you think from a policy perspective we can improve it? So I've been, a, obviously, as you know, I've been working with the federal statistical system for a long time. I've also worked with state and local agencies. I think where we're got to, going to have to go is to this notion of producing a national unemployment number or a national employment number might be helpful for the Federal Reserve, but for making decisions that you have very local labor markets, you've got very local businesses, business needs. It's a little bit like, you know, having a local weather service, right? You, you don't have a national temperature that's produced on the first Friday of every month, right? You, you, you get local forecasts and you get local reactions. So what you really want is data that's and I, and, you know, I use this rubric a lot, the, the labor market. So it's got to be timely. I don't want to figure out what happened three years ago. I want to know now. Um, it's got to be local because most people, are, they're not going to move. People don't move readily. Um, they do more in this country than in other countries, but still there's a lot of uh, inertia. And it's got to be actionable. So if you provide information uh, to people coming out of college or coming out of a, or trying to decide whether to take a credentialing program, uh, where are the earnings for people like me, right? So the mm -hmm. reason that the private sector has been so successful is you get on Netflix or you get on Amazon and the information is targeted to you. Right. Imagine having a labor market information system that says, well, Gil, with your background and your skills, if you just picked up a couple of these classes, you could get a job at this firm, right? Mm. Because other people like you have been able to get jobs there. That kind of reduction of friction, uh, which is caused by lack of information, is really where uh, the public sector could provide a public good. Now, to some extent, we get that the, the more well-off among us are able to do that. Your kids or, you know, get 
career coaching and they go to schools in which the career counselors give them very targeted information about people like them. What you know we're thinking about here is a democratization of that knowledge, not just for the few rich people or the few big companies, but really small businesses finding out where the workers are. Uh, people who have been dislocated used to be the old word, but you know, just a, 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 a more information. And when I say information, I don't mean data because mm. there's masses of data. I mean, this the advantage of AI and prediction is being able to provide data that's useful to you. Does that right. make sense? And yeah, actually, yeah. so I mean, generally, one could say if we can reduce search costs, we can reduce employment friction um, and, and make the economy work a lot better. Um, but I want to also ask you about decision making. So. You know, um, as you know, you know, in a lot of cases, the value of a decision comes from uncertainty around the data, not the data itself, uh, because we don't have, you know, too many cash flow <laughs> businesses anymore. We don't make nuts, bolts, and automobiles. We make um, fairly uncertain uh, services in many ways, uh, where option value is a lot more important than cash flow value. So in a regime where people are, you know, just sort of hunting for the data and nicely fit into SQL tables and Excel spreadsheets, I wonder if, if that is going to create some problems in the future. That's a good question. I, to that one, I don't have an answer. Sorry. Um, I mean, the whole point of the information is, is just to reduce the uncertainty, not to give you an exact answer, but and and to try and do it with as little bias as possible, right? So, yeah, yeah. So reducing uncertainty sometimes is not necessarily a good thing, um, especially you know if you think about emerging technologies and things like that. So, but I do think yeah. that certainly for policymakers, you know, they need to they need to have better information about where to pass put the bets right yes, and yes. what we're really going into is a is an area era of industrial policy right they're they're making bets and making bets on semiconductors on ai on quantum computing now it's not like you it, it's kind of like making a decision about trigger event the the question yeah. well we're not going to spend money on semiconductor well where what particular type what areas, what structure are they going to be big funding, small funding? Is it going to be peanut butter spread and so on? It's not like uh, money for R&D is like holy water that you sprinkle and then a miracle occurs, right? right. They're, if they're going to pursue industrial policy, then you should have some information about where you're going to spend the money. Now, are you going to spend, and, and, and there can be competing views like, uh, if you're, if, I think it's really important to have a diverse workforce, to have many, many eyes and many people of many backgrounds dealing with the problem. Well, that may be different. That may yield different results at a different speed than if you send money to the uh, Harvard or to Stanford, right? <laughs> so. With, you can't do both. You've got limited resources. Economists think about opportunity cost and and if you exactly what are you trying to optimize and how you're going to make those decisions, right? And to some extent, you have to figure out what is the impact of each one of them. Yeah. And yes. how are you going to measure that, right? And how are you going to measure that? Yeah. So. And that know, requires to... data about the workforce and you know, anyway, so it's, I'm preaching to the choir. No, no. So going, going back to the education question here. So, um, you know, if you go through an MBA program today, you take a lot of accounting classes. Accounting, I would argue, is completely automatable. Machines are a lot better than humans in accounting. Um, you take a lot of finance classes and 
there is a lot of cash flow businesses um, that we can apply those principles on. And so going back to the broader education question, are we graduating people with skills that are not really needed in the future? So that that's one of the issues, and and part of the 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 uh, issue with having data is too often we think we I told you we were in this box of industries where industries that the measures of industries that we have now used to be by what was produced, right? The plate steel right. versus uh, because it was mainly agriculture manufacturing. Then we jump to realizing in the 1990s, good heavens, we've got to think about, um, we're not just producing things anymore, we're producing services. So then they changed industry classifications to how things were produced. But yeah, so now, I tell you now we're talking about industries as industries of ideas. We don't right. have a way of organizing that. Now, the same thing with occupations. These occupational structures really are rooted in a 1990s view of the world. And if you really think about it, occupations are bags of skills. What they're trying, so we have much better information about skills now from things like monster.com. We, we can see how, what the hedonic value of the different skills are from the prices that are being posted on uh, career sites from the wages. So you can, you can figure out, okay, the value of acquiring this skill is X, the value of acquiring this skill is Y. I would bet that the, you know, you've made an assertion that accounting skills are not worth anything. That's probably a testable hypothesis, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, I agree. Uh, I'm just trying to create a debate here, Julia. Um, so, um, so, so there, there are two things there. One is um, what is needed. There is sort of uncertainty around what's needed. We don't know how the how the future is going to going to unfold, uh, and so you have you have to have some backup plans and 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 all of that. Um, the other thing is, you know, the uh, maybe this is a bias I have. It seems like policy questions are more important than mechanical questions. So, you know, we got engineering, we got finance, we got even um, life sciences, healthcare. They all tend to be a little bit mechanical, equation driven and heuristics driven. And if you, if you have set of data, the output is pretty well determined and you don't really have a lot of creativity around the output. Um, if you want the aircraft to fly or, you know, somebody going through operation theater, there isn't a lot of creativity there. Um, but are we sort of moving away from that into policy uh, questions, which are totally uncertain, right? I don't know if they're totally uncertain. I mean, <laughs> I'm in a policy school. And we, that's what we teach, right? I think we can do, uh, if you break, you, I agree that high-level policy questions are very difficult, but if you unpack them mm. to the more granular levels, I think, you know, I've got this high-level goal. Well, let's unpack what that means and bring it down to something that can be driven by evidence. And, and how do we unpack that? Because any probably you're the same as me. Anytime I've ever had a big goal, you unpack the steps that take you to getting to those goals. So that's that you you don't just say it's unknowable. We're scientists. Um, it may be that it's hard, but then you say you don't say, "Oh, that's a really hard problem." You say, "Oh, that's a really hard problem. Let's figure it out, right?" And what's the data and the evidence to get us to where we want to go? Yeah, I remember reading in one of your uh, research papers, or it might be the report that we want to talk about next. Um, that I'm very attracted to this idea, Julia. That you, you you talk about industry classifications as sort of networks because a lot of disciplines, a lot of companies, a lot of industries that can come together.
to to make a problem to solve a problem or make something work. So this you know sort of disaggregated industry classification seemed to have run its course, right? It's not that useful anymore. Yes. Yeah, so um, I think where we're heading, right, is that the the notion of an industry is almost an invisible college of ideas, mm. right? So you uh, if you think about AI, that's that's a group of people with with a common set of skills trying to figure out a certain set of questions. Um, so so the when you're so going back to the policy issue, what do I invest in? It becomes who do I want to attract into the field? What kind of skill sets do I want to attract in to try and figure out the answers to a, to a common question? And then you characterize um, industries by the ideas that people are trying to solve, right? Uh, and, and who are the people who are working on those ideas? That's the cluster of information and then uh, when you are trying to think about new industries forming, you can almost see these bursts of people jumping into the next uh, uh, a contiguous field. Uh, and, and, and those people go off and start something else. To some extent, that is what new businesses are about, right? It's, it's a group of people, oh, I've got a new idea. I'm going to start a new company. So it's right. tracing those workflows and and thinking about the um, the products that they produce now are really we really don't need a whole lot more things right, right. it's new ways of, it's new ways of putting ideas together and and I love this quote by Heidi Williams uh, from Stanford now I believe she's going to Dartmouth but she 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 says um, Innovation enables us to break the bounds of scarcity. Mm. And if you think about it, when we were producing things, what we were doing, we were bound by capital, labor, energy, material structures. You know, Clem's model where output is a function of the combination of those inputs. That matters a lot when you're producing things. But when you're producing um, new ways of combining those things and uh, the uh, really as Paul Roma says idea the value of an idea is it scales it's not you when I have an idea and I share it with you and you share it with someone else it doesn't depreciate so uh, you're not constrained in the way that you used to be yeah, it's sort of a cultural shift, isn't it? I mean, um, you know, it used to be a world of proprietary know-how, proprietary knowledge, patterns, and so on. Um, and economics come from that, those, that proprietary idea, proprietary knowledge. But as you say, that proprietary knowledge is not scalable. <laughs> and so it, it is by definition limited. And so now we are into sort of a different scenario, right? So think about all the uh, enormous strides that have been made from having open source code. Python's an open source product. Uh, Jupyter Notebooks, open source. Uh, so, so those ideas just scaled and had massive impacts on organizations and the way in which we do business. And there was, you know, there wasn't any capital, labor, energy materials that went into them, just people's ideas and sharing knowledge. Um, so I think that's that's the enormous potential. And that's what, again, going back to where we opened up with this National AI Research Resource, yeah. is to empower people and reward people for sharing their ideas, to promote collaboration, uh, to, to pursue the public good. Yeah, Does that okay. make sense? Yeah, talk a little bit about that, uh, Julia. So I know that you're intimately involved with this. So this is sort of a new initiative, right? National Artificial Intelligence Research Resource. Um, who, who are on it and what are your objectives? Well, so we, we, we had a set of uh, objectives that is in the AI Act. And so we were chartered to come up with the ideas. 
uh, and I should, um, just reading from what we were told to do, a, a future in which innovation flourishes and the promise of AI is realized in a way that benefits all Americans is the language that kind of we've used. So I think obviously none of us were paid to be on that committee. We spent a lot, a lot of time and energy, nights, weekends, and so on, get putting that report uh, uh, forward uh, because we believed in the mission uh, to promote innovation, to promote competitiveness in a way that benefited all Americans. And that was basically the vision that, that we all hewed to. And so, yeah, it's going to take some investment. I, I think we uh, suggested of the order of about six billion over uh, five years. Uh, part of it is um, at the core, there are a couple of things that resonated with me. There are many things that resonated with lots of people, but one of them was, um, you know, this notion that it, it should, there should be ethics and so on associated with it, but 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 one of them was that it has to be evaluated externally. It's not just we're going to send money and and magic's going to happen. You have to have a set of goals. You have to we wrote down a theory of change. These are, this is where the money is going to get spent, and there's going to be external evaluation at every step uh, to make sure. Not that you're micromanaging, but that there there is some external um, validity, and that the evaluation come from external measures, not just you know a self analysis that says, "Boy, we're doing a great job." <laughs> and then the second piece was, I think we're all very committed to the notion of diversity, yeah. uh, and diversity from many different messages, obviously uh, underrepresented minorities people from um, from different backgrounds, from different countries, from different skill sets. Uh, we talked about a lot of ways in which diversity matters. Um, and and I, I think at the core, you're not just thinking about equality of access. So at one point there was a discussion, well, the resources are going to be free for graduate students or postdocs. Mm. That's not the same thing as equality of opportunity because if you know you come from a wealthy background you can take a year off and work on ai maybe for certain groups you need to have scholarships to make sure that you actually come from an, a situation of you have equal opportunity to work with the data so it's it's thinking very deeply about the the barriers and trying to reduce those barriers not just say oh well uh we're thinking about not just the obvious barriers but the unseen barriers so those were important points you yeah know, look at look at how far this i i firmly believe in that i don't want to sound like a sap here that one of the reasons the united states has done so well is not for bleeding heart reasons but simply pragmatic reasons when you uh have a country that does, uh, with all its flaws, that does allow much more opportunity to a variety of different people, it just makes economic sense. It, may, it makes social sense, but it also makes economic sense. Yeah, so I, I don't know much about it, Julia. So um, you know New Zealand pretty well, you know Sweden, uh, you know yeah, Scandinavia. And I'm born. Um, they, they, my understanding is that they tend to be somewhat uniform in, in terms of, you know, people and, and all of that. Do you see a big problem there? Why well, always say, you know, so New Zealand has done a, has worked hard to increase its diversity. And I, I think that to their credit, they've done a good job on that. But same thing in, uh, in Sweden. Um, so I, I don't want to, I don't want to say a country ha has more problems or less problems or I'm going to get in trouble at home. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I am going to say unambiguously, this is a really good country. This country is a good country to be a woman. It's been, uh, and I think it's been a good country to be an immigrant. 
Yeah, that, that is definitely true. You know, I, I, I have been an immigrant here as well. That, that's, I can definitely, um, definitely agree with that. But I had this looking from afar, uh, Julia, maybe this is not true really. I mean, I have this admiration for New Zealand. Uh, Jacinda just uh, stepped down. She said, I just can't take this anymore. Uh, but it, it, seems... it was pretty brutal for her from what I can tell. <laughs> but it seems like it's a country that has things together. Yeah, so, so where I was going was, you know, is diversity a necessary condition for success? Or is it just convenient? Well, that's beyond my pay grade, Gil. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You could ask sociologists this, uh, or we could have a discussion over a beer. But um, I do think that from an economic point of view, as a labor economist, that if you don't use all your human capital to the maximum amount possible, you're below your your production frontier, right? Just from Econ 101. And I, and I think figuring out ways to make the best use of a variety of different resources does seem to certainly have been the ticket in the US. And there, you know, there's been a lot of academic work on the on the productivity gains of the Civil Rights Act. Right. right. So yeah, so so I want to finish up with sort of a macroeconomic question, Julia. So um, there is a there's a war brewing not in Ukraine, but in artificial intelligence. And you have India, 1.4 billion, you have China, 1.4 billion, you have EU, I don't know what it is, but 600, 700 million. So we have four, five, six, seven blocks um, that is sort of competing with each other, right? So whoever wins the AI sort of competition, is is going to have a great advantage, right? So, what do you think? What do you think is happening, and what do you think is going to happen? Let's speculate a bit. I really don't know. That that's <laughs> I I maybe feel like I'm um, uh, equivocating, but but I am. I that's I yeah, that's so far beyond the realm that I operate on. I'd just be uh, spouting at that point. So let, let, me you, let me ask you. Let me ask you. A uh, different question, uh, Julia. So, do you think the U.S. is um, ahead in AI, or do you think other countries are, you know, really about the same? So, I'm going to say it's absolutely impossible to tell. I, because for all the reasons that I said, we don't have an operational definition, so we can't really say how many people are working in it or what our industries are. I think it. I think. I'm very interested in moving the ball forward in the measurement issues. Yeah. Because at the heart, I love the Simon uh, uh, Winchester book, the, the Precision Perfectionists, uh, because I can't answer that question if I can't, if I don't have the data and the measurement. And I think that's one of the things that we need to, at the core is part of the NAIR report is, Let's get a measurement system in place so we understand who's working in these particular areas and exactly get some sense of what they're doing mm -hmm. because then we can make some assertions rather than just anecdotes about where we've been and where we're going. Okay. Yeah, I mean, everybody benefits from that information. So perhaps, you know, some sort of competitive uh, AI competitive uh, index or something along those lines, perhaps. Um, around the world could be quite useful, right? In some ways, but it's really yeah. The OECD put put together a, a suggested set of ways, but it, uh, it I, I think it was a, a very good initial start. But uh, we can do a lot better in terms of measurement. It's not just the words in in scientific papers. It's what data sets are being used, what people are working on on these different topics. And that requires a rethinking our data infrastructure. So it goes back to the democratizing our data book in which I say, you know, we're in a whole new world. We need to be thinking our, uh, our, our evidence infrastructure so that we can figure out where we are so that we know where we're going. So we need data to do that. Uh, and so 
it, it all comes back to data. <laughs> can you <laughs> can you get it? Can you standardize it? Can you use it in a systematic way? Can you uh, um, you know call out the biases from that data? All those questions, right? So and I think I think we we had very robust discussions in the in their task force. I. I wrote a piece in Issues of Science and Technology uh, for the National Academies that's uh, up on the web that's also imaginatively called Democratizing Our Data. Um, and uh, got I've got a bunch of suggestions in there as well. I do think it's uh, uh, manageable with existing um, technologies and I'd like to see us invest in that area because otherwise, if you don't know what you're investing in, how do you know where to invest? And how do you know whether you've got there when you get there, right? Yeah, you're doing great work, Julia. Thanks so much, uh, so much for that. And thanks for joining me today. It's lovely always to chat to you, Gil. I, I look forward to having a cup of coffee or, uh, yes. or something a bit harder when you're in New York <laughs> next. And, and I won't talk about Australia. Yeah. I don't talk about Australia. It's full of Australians. <laughs> I've got to tell a joke. You know, the um, uh, a New Zealander goes into Australia and comes into the customs, and the customs official looks at him and says, "Oh, says, you had any criminal convictions?" <laughs> and the New Zealander looks at him and says, "Oh, is that still a requirement for entry?" <laughs> No, as you know, uh, New Zealand is playing a T20 game with India tonight. So, yeah. so we, are, we are enemies tonight. Okay, we'll be enemies tonight. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, no. yeah. Thanks, Thanks so much, again. Bill. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.